This is In Boot Camp, Episode 17, Maximum Development Efficiency, on Saturday, May 11th, 2019, with your hosts, Matthew Petchel and Ryan Rampersad. You can find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash IB17. Hey. Hey, how's it going? It's going well. How about you? Good. Completed another week of boot camp. Yes, week 17. Yes. And before we get to the show, remember, we have to talk about the weather. The weather in Duluth is really bad. Weather around here, pretty decent. Pretty decent. Uh, how much snow did you say Duluth got? Uh, it got 10 inches of snow on May 9th, which broke a 117-year-old record. And for those of you yeah. that don't know, we, Duluth is about an hour and a half away from us. Yeah, and that's a, that's a lot of snow for this time of year, so yes. that's uh, that's a great record. And now after the weather update, we can do a show. Yeah, so uh, let's talk about what you've been doing in class. Well, class has pretty much just been group work time for our second group project, but we did have just a tiny bit of um, you, you making unit tests and testing things and um, testing your endpoints, testing everything. Because, you know, we've been making little APIs to do with stuff and little Git routes and post and everything. So now they wanted us to make test cases for everything else using... So remember how we talked the other day about uh, Chai and Mocha? Well, I guess there's Chai HTTP, um, which is completely different than Chai, and you have to include it separately. More tools. Like, last week was all about tools and tools and tools, and this is just, like, just... There's other things besides learning how to code that makes coding better. When you were uh, writing some of your tests... um... Like, were you writing those for just little, like little toy things, or were you writing that in the context of some group project, like little mini team group project? We were given exercises, which were like toy things, and then they said to implement them in your project, but our project's not at the point where we can actually test that, because it's a pile of broken code right now, and um, I'll take charge and fix it tomorrow, is the plan. It's a work in progress, and it's kind of cool, and also it's very Englishy. It doesn't really feel like code. Um... So can you give me an example of that? So like in one of the examples they shipped out, um, there is this expect and then response body and then it's parentheses and then two dot B dot N and then parentheses array dot that dot has dot length of two. And it's just really Englishy. It doesn't really feel. Yeah, but I mean, that's just how Chai is. Yeah. Do you, do you like that style of testing? I think it's funny to look at, but no, not really. What would you prefer? I don't know. Um, so there's another way. So there's other ways to have it, and it is it, and then and then you just parentheses should do something, 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 and then expects and stuff. You don't have to have all this other stuff. That's I feel like that's really overboard. Yeah, that's pretty much what I feel like too. I've used the Chai Mocha Sinan testing style pretty frequently. And what what I what I struggle with it is that you don't always know what methods are available on any of the subsequent methods that you're calling. So, well, you've done dot b. Well, now what do I do? Do I do dot is? Do I do a? Do I do and? Do I do or? Like I don't know. And if you don't have some kind of uh, intelligent editor or something similar to that, you might not be able to figure it out easily. So they never made it into the group project yet. And I don't know for sure if they actually will. That's probably okay. Maybe this project won't require, but but I but I expect some one of them will. Uh, speaking of group project, let's talk about the group project. Yeah, well, it's um, not coming along, and it's kind of gotten stagnant. Um, I was so excited about how last Saturday went because it's been a week today um, since we started. Yes, yeah, so so it's it's a two week project. You're halfway through, and already you're showing signs of. Not going so well. Complete fatigue and failure. Well, that was pretty quick. So explain explain what happened. We had a ton of steam going. Tuesday was great. We're all going. We all know what we're working on. And then kind of people stopped working on it. There's been no real progress since Tuesday. And so for the audience, can you remind us what you're working on? Oh, we are making a little um, character creation tool for keeping track of your stats for the one and only Dungeons and Dragons game. Okay, so so far uh, a week later you haven't don't have much to show for it, but what do you have after a week? We have a breathtakingly gorgeous front end UI. Like it just you go to the page, it's absolutely beautiful. If you're on a screen that is exactly the screen of the person who made it. 
the background is a static image that's one size. That's like a thousand, less than a thousand pixels wide. Like, there's not room to expand. It might look okay, but it's, it's this beautiful landscape picture of this waterfall in the background, uh, a float well, it's on a floating island that's floating in the sky. It's what you'd imagine Dungeons and Dragons to look like. It's just this beautiful world. Um, it just it screams adventure and beautifulness. And there's an empty sky, and then where the empty sky is is kind of like just the login button, and it's the kind of like a splash paragraph about, hey, you've made it to the site, click here to register, click here to log in. And it looks great if you're on the desktop. So are you using Bootstrap or anything to help you with this, or is it all just hand-coded CSS? It's all hand-coded. That's really interesting. You know, I feel like if you don't have a lot of time and you're just trying to get things done, it seems usually easier to use Bootstrap or something similar. Yeah, like just Jumbotron the splash page and just boom, 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 we're done. Yeah, a Jumbotron there, a container here, a couple of grids here and there, you know, that kind of thing. What we also have is a beautiful characters page. And so one of the group members is a design guy. Like he absolutely loves Photoshop and other things. Mm-hmm. And he made a bunch of these. Um, so like your hit points would have a heart around it. Your key attribute stats would have this kind of like a commander's tag and guild wars thing. Well, he made yeah. all of these by scratch and they are just awesome and they're like 510 bytes each they're all svg files he made them it's not copyrighted it just looks gorgeous so you and you intend to put text inside of these little icons yeah just just little numbers um we ran into a little problem it looks great with two numbers well let's say it's like you're level 35 now and you just went from 99 hit points to 101 hit points you know it's funny that you mentioned that seconds after i was about to ask you (laughs) Uh, that is exactly the problem with putting uh, containers around little numbers. And yeah. I asked him right away, and then he, we looked at it. And, I mean, it looks beautiful. Um, and for demo purposes, of course we're not going to put a three-digit number in there. Because um, when you make a demo and stuff, you get, to pick the cu- you get to pick the data, you get to pick the stuff. We're not trying to break it now. We're trying to show off how great we are. And you know what? For, for a, a two-week uh, timeline, I think that's okay. Not everything has to be perfect. It just has to be good enough. We have a little schema sequel. And what I had in there was just create database characters. And that's it. That's all. That's, that's, that's one line. Well, somebody went in there and started adding a bunch more lines um, trying to create tables. We're using SQLize. You do not create tables. You do not drop tables. You do not do anything. You do not drop databases. It just, it's one line. There's no comments. There's nothing. Like it's just you cannot create a database with SQLize. Um, it's just it's just how it is. And so I was kind of upset when that got mutilated. But you know, I mean, I I changed it back. So the next merger, um, I'm getting my way. So we had this little breakdown of front end and back end. You're doing this. You're doing that. When you push stuff back into backland. Uh, so on the front end, you're going to have, well, we were using jQuery with Ajax to, you know, send the stuff back. Mm-hmm. That's part of the back end, I guess, somehow. And I would I would argue that, no, it's not. That that That's totally, you know, I mean, it, the in class, because everything that we've done in the group project is something we've done as an exercise in class. Um, it's not like right. this is something we had to go learn to do. And all of their examples had like an HTML file that just had at the little bottom a little script tag that was just like, okay, form fill, form send, Ajax, blah, blah, blah and yada, yada, yada. Uh, code is magically transported to backland land. Um, they don't see it that way, um, which just means, you know, I get to be a front end developer. Or now, you as a professional, would you say that when you're saying like, I'm going to handle the front end, that, that that JavaScript is something that, isn't front end the javascript that you're talking about is pretty much the realm of the front end team that said they have to work very closely with the back end team to know what the shape of the data needs to be and what the api endpoints will be because without that it doesn't matter if there is a back end the front end needs to know the the requirements in the interface that the back end is providing and demanding 
there's there's some more nuance to that though. So I've worked in some really large front end applications, and there's sort of this uh, split even on the front end. There's sort of this front end, front end, and front end back end. So when an app gets big enough, you might have such high decoupled user interfaces from the data layer that powers those interfaces that there might even be some kind of emulated back end, but on the front end portion of the code. They don't have to be wrong, but there probably are. All I know is I got a lot of stuff to do tomorrow. Um, Tuesday, I just kind of want to have every, when we walk in Tuesday, I just want it working. We can add last minute features. They can try to break it all they want and I'll block all merges. I'll fork, I'll fork the repo and I'll take control. I, I'm, I'm hostile in nature. When you, when you, when you're done with all of this, do you have to do a presentation thing again? Yes. And I already started making a bunch of crap for it because last time, the guy that's in my group again decided that he was going to make it and not share it, and we had no idea until the day of. So are you using the professional tool, Google Docs, spreadsheet, slides. Uh, presentations? Yes. Yeah, slides. Yes. And I already picked the theme. I already put some filler content. So Gary Gyglax was a very inspirational person. He has so many quotes and stuff, and I I picked one of his quotes like about how games should be played, and it's just last time it was way too dry. Like there was no spice to our presentation. There was no yeah. There was there were no jokes. Like, yeah, I'm not I'm not just talking about jokes. Just just like having a slide with a quote from the guy who made D and D and stuff. Like just just something that isn't a hundred percent code related. Um, I, I thought that spacing it out would be would be a great way to break it up because that's something that we really didn't have last time. Like it was just it it made it feel rushed. Uh, but ha- having this, you know, like a dead th- these random dead pages in the presentation. I don't want to say dead pages, but there's just something to help break up the presentation a little bit. I think it will make it much more professional because we're doing less with more, and every member of the group can look at it. No members of the group have looked at it yet. On one hand, that's amazing. On the other hand, that's disappointing. Yes. Yeah. Um, and two group members seem to be completely checked out. Well, that was quick. Yeah. Well, and it also happened last time as well. Um, I mean, last time, two of them never even committed. And so this time we made sure everyone could commit. And so stuff that's worthless got committed and I removed it. But at least I can say that my group members we're completely committed this time. That's good. I'm I'm glad you can say at least that much. Yeah, and that's that's about all I can say. Um and so today was the one and only stamp out hunger food drive that the postal service puts on. And it makes for a longer day because we have to pick up a lot of food and drive the food to a distribution site um where it gets you know, put on another truck or brought somewhere else, and it takes a lot of time. Uh mm-hmm. we're just wasting time looking at people do that so i kind of left and went back to work halfway through class so i was there for about two hours and then left two hours early did did your team notice at all or ask anything yes yeah i i kind of gave them a little heads up like you guys i think i'm gonna leave and then and about half hour later i left told them all that i was gonna go crazy and if you want something in there make sure to commit it before you leave today like whatever you work on between in the next two hours make sure to put it up so i know that you did it because you know don't want to reinvent the wheel twice don't want to recode something and it is now almost 10 o'clock and nothing has been committed so i well, assume they did I nothing think you know what hours. to do exactly yeah go rogue which is what actually ended up happening last time, too. Um, yeah. Also, problem is, is I don't fully understand what I need to even do. So it's going to uh, be a little mystery even to me. I think you understand more than you think you do. I just don't know how it's all going to come together quite yet. Um, and I think I might have to rewrite quite a bit. And it would be nice if I had two monitors to work on tomorrow. No, can't have that. For For an extended discussion audience... Listen to this episode's Fringe, uh, where Matt and I talk about what we like to call hours and hours of agony. So, speaking of agony, um, I had a little bit of an issue with Travis and um, our ES linting rules and stuff. Um, And we had a little philosophical discussion with my group members because they're all doing front-end stuff and they're not using fancy pants stuff. And so, our ES linting rules 
seem to be taken from like years and years ago when you couldn't do anything cool in ES6. And that's fine for the front end people. Like they're everything passes the linting test. But when I want to do something cool or arrow functions or something else, it all fails. And so I went over to the teacher and like, hey, hey, this is broken. Help me. And like, OK, go to create react something. And then there's this husky tool that's going to automatically um, run prettier. And then all the formatting changes will be done that way. And it's going to be great. Um, and he took me to a blog post about how to do all this. And when he's on my computer and he's going to the site and finding the blog post and everything else, he was trying to interact with his menu on the side of the blog. And then he's like, huh, it's not working. I'm like, well, of course, it's JavaScript. And then, and then he looks at me kind of puzzled, like, yeah, like, I have disabled all JavaScript. And then he goes, like, you know, Matt, you broke, like, the entire internet when you do that. Why would you do that? I'm like, I don't like ads. And then he turns to me, like, well, obviously, if you go that far. And then it just reminded me back to one of my first memories of him when he was first sharing his projector, um, his laptop over the projector. He sees ads. He sees banner ads. He sees all sorts of ads. I mean, I have extensions. For, I have uBlock Origin. I have this YouTube Enhancer th- app. Uh, no script. I hate ads. I hate being tracked. Um, you can. Do you know how many sites use Google Analytics? Almost everyone. Um, and so I block all that. I block everything. And he thinks that that is just the ridiculousest of ways to go through life. Yeah, I would say there's some kind of balance there. Uh, using uh, uBlock and uMatrix and so on, that's great. Blocking all JavaScript in your primary browser, maybe not ideal for typical day-to-day usage. Well, it's kind of fun now that I know a little more about web development and stuff, and when I see that they're bringing in like 17 JavaScript files, it's kind of weird. So I was looking at buying an Apple product to solve my hours and hours of agony and stuff. And so when you go to apple.com and you look at the JavaScript pages it's trying to load, it loads a single. Like all yep. Apple hosts everything themselves. Wikipedia, one thing. All these other crappy sites, they're the ones with seven imports. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a weird world out there, isn't it? Yeah, and this coding boot camp has really helped me understand how things are made and where things go and why everyone's tracking everyone and that you're never secure and everything is public. And you're just here at the tip of the iceberg. It, this this rabbit hole goes so deep and so far. And understanding how the pieces work, as you said earlier, is not easy and it can take a long time. And I'm hoping that when I start working in the industry that it'll be a um, easier flow. Like I'll start learning more and everything will be great. Speaking of working in the industry, I heard something like that happened. Potentially. A potential opportunity of a potential real world job happened to me this week. That sounds like a lot of potential. I think you should tell me about it. Yes. For our dedicated long-term listeners, on several weeks ago, exactly, we talked about HackerX, and I met with one of the recruiters for a company. Basically, he told me almost right away that, you know, we're not looking for somebody with your skill set right now. And then we proceeded to spend the rest of the five minutes talking about dogs or cats or just something to pass the time. And in this minutes of stuff i mean I, in, the conversation flowed or we liked each other and it was just like you know they just didn't need me um and and that was a recurring theme because i i am incredibly junior i'm not experienced i don't know anything yet i'm just a boot camper and he left that company and now he's at company b and company b has a perfect opportunity for me and so I asked him a little bit more about it. He sent me a link to the thing. And I told him that, yeah, I'm pretty much a JavaScript guy, JavaScript everything. And he turns and says, well, this will be a great opportunity for you to learn Java. And so trying to sell myself as a JavaScript developer lands me a Java job. Yes. And something else unusual happened. So the job describes itself as a associate software engineer and customer support. And when I proceeded to tell you about this, you kind of told me that this might not be what I think it is. Um, so what is your, now that you've worked in the industry for years, and I'm sure you you socialize and network with other people, and everyone's got a different path they've taken in life to get to where they are. What have you heard about people in customer support roles in the software world? Yeah, so 
Uh, it seems like this is sort of one of those interesting sort of common tactics for some companies to get people who are on average a little bit better than their um, run of the mill uh, customer support agent. Um, but it's also a way to get cheaper engineering uh, without having to pay for an actual engineering salary. And so it's sort of sort of the worst of both worlds. So you are helping the company by being a better customer support agent because like you have you you've kind of been technical for a long time you actually have some capability to reason about how the software potentially works because you have in theory some software engineering background at this point but the company is also taking advantage of you because now they can say well here go do the software engineering work even though you're getting the salary of a customer support agent but we'll give you some uh trivial or annoying work to do which may be um, manual testing, it could be writing tests, it could be, um, as they say here in the documentation, defect verification, and, you know, some menial tasks such as that. Now, in a truly or uh, agile organization, you wouldn't have a person do that. You would have the team that built the software do that just as part of their normal and natural work. So I would say that I would be uh, dubious about this kind of position. Um, you know, when you see a position that has a comma in it, that's probably not a good sign, especially at an entry level position. So, like, you could be the director of engineering, director of engineering, comma, and senior vice president of marketing. That might be okay. That's a comma that's acceptable. But when you're an entry level customer support, maybe not so acceptable. So, if you thought that was good, you should be excited. Uh, up until this next point. So you thought, okay, fine, maybe you could be an associate software engineer, comma, customer support. Like everything I said, maybe it's okay. Like maybe it isn't terrible. But then you read through the job description and you find this strange technology that really shouldn't ever be used on the web ever. And and here here is kind of what it uh, goes on to say, right? The Associate Software Engineer Customer Support provides individual technical support on software incidents in product offerings, the company's product offering for mission-critical front-end origination workflow. This application is a standard three-tier architecture. The web-based user interface has been developed with Delphi for maximum development efficiency. So uh, being a junior software engineer at this point, what word in there do you think kind of stands out as being a little bit strange? Delphi? Delphi! Have you ever heard of this revolutionary technology for maximum development efficiency? That is what they're calling it, and Delphi is not one of those things. It is an old programming language from many, many, many years ago. I mean, uh, the 90s, so that's what I mean. Uh, sure, I'm sure somebody still uses it, but it is not used now for anything, especially not front-end anything. So when yeah. Matt came to me a, a week ago and he showed me this letter, uh, you know, I was kind of uh, suspicious as soon as I saw the comma customer support. But as soon as I saw Delphi, that sealed the deal. So you think this is a little weird? Oh, it's a lot of weird. It, it's exciting to get some kind of person to reach out to you, especially when you're in a boot camp and you're not making calls daily and, you know, reaching out to everybody yourself. Very cool. I agree. Uh, so customer support, suspicious. Delphi suspicious, and then finally, uh, the 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 required qualifications. Of course, it asks for a bachelor's degree in computer science or related or equivalent experience. And so, being from a boot camp, it doesn't inspire me that they think that their position is so flexible that you don't actually need a bachelor's degree. Of course, if it is just a customer support position, sure, of course, a person from a boot camp would be sufficient. So that's why I would be suspicious on that. So with all of these strange and suspicious things that stand out, I would be uh, cautious. You got to start somewhere when you switch industries. Like, um, I'm not going to get a fancy pants job right off the bat, I don't think, with just having a boot camp. I agree. You will not get a fancy pants job. However, you should get at least a job that has pants. Oh, man, these pantless jobs are something to be careful then. It's a slippery slope kind of thing. So let's say you did work at a, a place like this, which may be what fine. What if I just worked there for two years? 
may be fine, but the the danger of that is that you will be put into a team that isn't a team. You will have no mentorship, no supervision, or worse, you'll have anti mentorship and anti supervision, which which is uh, management that drives you crazy and mentorship that teaches you wrong things. Uh, apparently, we will be working on a revolutionary and cutting edge Delphi system from the nineties, but. Your core strengths, which are going to be front-end engineering with uh, React, presumably, and other such technology, and Node on the back end in JavaScript, all gets thrown out the window and gets instead uh, replaced with Java, a stack you're not familiar with today. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm still going to go forward with it as if I'm taking it seriously. Yes, now that is exactly what you should do. Going forward with it, actually getting an actual in-person interview... um, you know, these, uh, what do you call these things? Job postings. These are all kind of um, things a business has to sanitize of any information, lest somebody actually try to apply themselves. So what happens with these kind of things is that they have nothing, there's nothing written here that you couldn't replace for some other business with three words. Right? I mean, there's yeah. if somebody replaced Delphi with uh, Lisp, would anybody know? Like, I wouldn't. It could be the same job for a different company. So when that being the case, getting an in-person interview is very could be very interesting and very entertaining. And it's in downtown Minneapolis, and that's not too bad for me to get to by train. It just takes a while. Yeah, so that that was an interesting thing, too. So I I was uh, also surprised when you sent me the map link here because that's not near where you live at all. It is right next to the train station. It's uh, next to the government center train stop. And so I would go to the park and ride in Fridley, hop on the blue line, take that over to the government center, which I think is on the green line. So there is a switch. Uh, yes, it is. It's green, green or blue line, actually. Oh, it's both? Yeah. In Minneapolis, okay. the blue line and green line are equivalent. I see. That's why I've gone by it then. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I do look forward to hearing more about this journey uh, of... For for this particular job position, um, but speaking about jobs, uh, I, I will stress again, and for for you and other listeners who are in boot camps or in similar positions, you are not looking for a job; you are looking to begin your career. And this may be a job, but if you're looking to begin a career, which is a potentially li- lifelong opportunity full of ups, downs, lefts, and rights, with growth in all of that. Beginning your career is the the goal that you were looking for, and this doesn't sound like a career to me. This sounds just like a job. Uh, hey, where can we find you on the internet? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially at Twitter at RyanMar, and of course on my website, RyanRampersad.com. And how about you? And you can find me at TheNexus.tv slash peoples. That is a strange place to find you. Uh, do, do you have a website? I do. It's MatthewPetrol.com, and you should be able to find that if you've Googled me. Because there's not many people with the name Petrol. Uh, there, there are very few. And of course, you can leave us comments on Reddit at reddit.com slash r slash the nexus. And of course, you can support us and uh, listen to us more at patreon.com slash the nexus TV. And where can we find the show notes? Ah, uh, you can find the show notes for this episode at the nexus.tv slash IB17. Have a good one. Have a good one. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from, from the, the Technological, technological Convergence. convergence.